thanks for the kind words. Now, adaptation and improvisation, but your weakness is not your technique. Well, I figured over the course of the last one and a half days that, uh, well, adaptation and improvisation, I think I have to adapt my, my presentation somehow, uh, because there was an, an ever upcoming topic coming up, and, uh, and so could, could you do the switch? I also extended it to some extent. Right? Dancing on rainbows, pink fluffy unicorns 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 dancing on rainbows. I promise not to do the singing once on dancing on rainbows. Yeah, I'm mad. Yes. <laughs> yes, that, that's a joke. All right. Now, I was kidding. Well, the thing is, in order to get a book, I decided you need to ask me a clever question. I consider that a clever question. Thanks. Now, back on track. I have two more, so <laughs> keep up with your questions. Adaptation and improvisation, but your weakness is not your technique. Um, I dropped out of English classes at 11th grade back in school. I also dropped out of German classes back in school. And uh, over the course of my being at the university, I had colleagues who said, okay, um, here's, here's this great movie, Matrix, you have to watch it, but you have to watch it in English. I ended up with, I, I was uncertain at the time because I well, dropped out of English classes in school and so on, whether or not I could listen to it, I couldn't understand everything, and I ended up with watching it like 60 times at this point. And uh, I love this movie, this is why I picked the title there. And I think it has a lot to do with what I'm going to tell about. So, I don't know if you're ready to see what I want to show you. But unfortunately, you and I have run out of time. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there is something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It's this feeling that brought you here. It's the question that drives us. It's a question that brought you here. You know the question just as I did. What is agile testing? <laughs> the answer is out there, and it will find you if you let it to. Agile testing is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your monitor. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to lunch, when you pay your technical debt. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? that you are a slave. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what agile testing is. You have to see it for yourself. Then skip forward. Morpheus has just given Neo the introduction to what the Matrix is. He says, what is Agile testing? Control. 
well. <clears throat> you remember when Morpheus and Neo are fighting the first time? At some point, the battle stops, and Morpheus says, good, adaptation and improvisation, but your weakness is not your technique. What he has to learn at that point is that there are rules in the Matrix, rules like rules in a computer game. Some of them can be bad. Others can be broken. But, well, we, we have certain rules, like the Agile Manifesto, the principles behind that. Um, and all good rules should not be applied with unthinking faith, right? I will respond for change, but if you give me the money for it, if I can get some, some food for it, right? Now, this doesn't help. Um, currently, we are in a state of uh, our industry where the whole world of software development is changing. It's not only that software development, well, with the introduction of Agile with Scrum, Kanban, XP, and all the other methodologies, we are currently in a state that, that software development itself is changing. But not only software development, but also Agile is changing. And with Agile, with the aspiring new methodologies like Kanban and Lean Startup, which we saw this morning in Jürgen's talk, the whole thing starts to shift. In the early days, there were early adopters adopting to Agile. Right now, there are more and more enterprises going there or trying to do that. And you can see more and more of these, well, like you could say scrum slaves and so on. And with that world being in constant change, it's also that testing alongside has to change. We have to adapt, we have to change, we have to improve, improvise on whatever we do, right? But it's not only the techniques that we know, right? And no one I heard really talks about uh, techniques like um, domain analysis, like equivalence classes, like all these traditional testing techniques anymore. It's the things we have in our mind that we can do. It's more that we apply exploratory testing and go on from there, right? So, but the rule seems to say, okay, I will respond to change, but that, that's not our point. So, in the end, I, I have a dream, and I'm going to reveal it to you at the end of this presentation. So, and I think that we can go further from where we are currently. Okay? So, where are we regarding techniques? Well, it takes, like Malcolm Gladwell says in Outliers, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice in order to reach mastery to become an expert. So how do you do that? Two years ago, I had a talk here, well, it was back then in Berlin, on alternative paths to self-education in software testing, where I had different techniques, which I did, like read a book. What I find myself doing is when I read a book, the next day I have to try it out when I'm at work. Then the learning sticks really well. Other things, like Jose said, uh, actually keep two blocks. If you want to read stuff I write in German, it's not that heavily maintained, but I also have a German blog and an English blog. I write articles, I write books. Writing keeps you learning more about the things. You can also do a conference presentation or something else. Right? There are other techniques which has come up since, since two years ago. I had like uh, weekend testing in place, there are testing dojos and so on. Right now we are setting up test automation code retreats. Does anyone know the concept of a code retreat? A few, okay. Okay, the idea behind a test automation code retreat is that you automate some tests within 45 minutes, then you delete all your code, pair up with another guy, and do it over again for 45 more minutes. And at the end of the day, you will have had six 45-minute sessions where you've learned lots of things. Right? So you can apply directly your testing knowledge there, put it into production directly. Or you could take a challenge. 
we have certain other challenges. For example, James Buck offers uh, Skype coaching, coaching over Skype. You can uh, just answer him, uh, no, not answer him, but question, can you give me a challenge? And he's going to give you one, and he's going to, to have a debate with you on what you are doing there. Um, I'm part of the Miyagi Do school in software testing. We have challenges in order to, to have our members there grow. And, um, well, thing is, you go out, test something, you have something, you have a mission, you follow up on that, and we have a discussion afterwards how it worked, and we do some sort of assessment, right? So we know all these things. Deliberate practice takes you to mastery, we can do this. But what, what does hold us back? How come there are so many agile introductions watering down or going to, to a state which is not so, well, good, like we had this morning with Melly, who is not so happy to go to work? Now, I found a quote while reading a book last year which says, if we have mastered a few of these fundamentals along with a habit of curious exploration, we can rediscover special techniques as we need them. Um, fundamentals, testing knowledge, test design knowledge, you could take BBST class, but, but how do we uh, go along from there, right? Um, well, in Becoming a Technical Leader, Jerry Weinberg describes three different things that yields innovations that yields innovation, right? First, you could learn from failure. If you do something wrong, you can learn from it. That is why we have retrospectives in place, for example. You could, next thing to get to innovation is to copy behavior from others. Oh, they're doing Scrum, they're doing good, let's do it the same. It could work, but maybe you, but maybe there's some other thing that you don't have in place there, it's a cultural thing maybe, or I don't know. And third, for innovation to stick, or one method to come up with innovation is like Jürgen's blog once said, uh, two great ideas having sex with each other. So you combine two good ideas and make up a new idea. Actually, if you take a look into what agile methodologies are all about, pair programming has been there, TDD has been there since the 60s. It's nothing new, it's just the composition of all these things together. Right? So we need to explore more, curious exploration. Now the curious thing is, where I found this quote, is a book called Computer Programming Fundamentals from Leeds and Weinberg, dated 1961. So it's more than half of a decade old, half of a century, sorry. More than 50 years old. They write about basic programming principles in there, about assembler language programming. No one, does anyone do assembler these days? Oh, there are, there are a few, interesting, right? We have built up more and more technology tech based on that since then, right? If you take a look on, on our whole stack, we are not at zeros and ones, but we have gone beyond that with assembler, with higher level programming language like C, and now we are on object oriented or even platforms that are built up on the JVM and don't, don't consider all the frameworks we have in place there that our programmers are using. And if you take a look into it, there's, there's a whole lot of things that could go wrong while we're doing that. I'm, I'm still afraid, well, I'm not so afraid because I won't live then anymore. If you think back about the year 2000 problem, right? Consider the year 10,000 problem. No one will know how the hardware is done back then. Okay. So how do we continue from there? Well, one of our problems is management. Oh, th this is not management 3.0, I think this is 1.0, or maybe 0 0.9, I'm not sure. Um, management. There's this, this conception of management, you can do it by, by measurement. That means you do it fully supervised. The manager has direct insights into whatever you're doing. It heavily relies on extrinsic motivations like KPIs and so on. I'm currently involved, for example, with, um, with a client who has KPIs in place there. 
uh, the funny thing is they, they are doing Scrum. They are introducing Scrum into their, their large project. They have uh, had one try to build their software earlier, and they ended up with a lot of technical debt. So they said, okay, we have something wrong. We need to control this. We need to put control in place here in order to continue from there. So we came up with reasonable KPIs in order to build a maintainable product, because they found out after 15 years, we have to still maintain it. So what did they do? They came up with a developer handbook. They wrote in that handbook, OK, you need to have 50% branch coverage. You need to have no loops in your architecture. You need to have this and that. And they're enforcing it using continuous integration. Right? They have software running there that is con constantly checking their architecture, all of their like find bugs, static code reviews, and so on. Now, the funny thing is we were introduced there as uh, technical coaches. And um, the interesting thing is when we got to the teams, to the actual developers, we found out no one read that handbook. They just saw built as failing messages coming from the continuous integration system, and they were just adhering to these rules to say, OK, what we found was they generated unit tests in order to reach that 50% bar. But these were actually bad. Like, uh, glue code sitting between a REST interface and uh, EJB interface and just forwarding it all the time. Like uh, th These classes were automatically covered by, um, by unit tests that were generated for that code. And it didn't work. So we had a conversation with them. Do you think this is really working? And this is how we uh, should do it. And uh, this is a better way to reach that 60%. And there's a reasonable uh, thing behind these KPIs in order to have them. Once we explained that to the developers, things started to go smoother and smoother from there. But that's not all how we can do ma management. It all drives down actually to a control cycle. Right? So you have a problem. When you have a problem, you enter some sort of cycle. The cycle here is, OK, we want to have control over that. We want to have um, a maintainable product still in 15 years from now. How do we reach that? And we failed to do that the first time. They evaluated that problem. They had a code review document of, for the old system of 200 pages. Basically saying, OK, this is all red. You should fix this and this and this. Then they got some advice what they should do about it. Like, OK, we can f enforce on an architecture level something here. We can uh, measure the code coverage percentage. We can mm, do static code analysis, static code reviews. And then what you end up with is, Compliance. I will respond to change, right? But not necessarily something that, that is really helpful. The interesting thing is just by reaching that compliance, you're going to, to extend that, that, that control cycle because then you find out, okay, he's just complying, he's not doing good work, so I have to control him more. So that is a downward spiral there. So why do you end up with that? It all drives down to, to a mindset, you could say, that employers are inherently lazy. They don't like work. They don't like to go to work. I, we heard this this morning, right? That 50% uh, of the Americans don't like to go to work. And they will avoid work if they can. So what do we do from the measurement perspective is we, we need a lot of supervision in order to get there. We need to have our systems controlled. And we, we need to have it comprehensive controlled. So this is called theory X. But that's not all that you can do. That's the magic thing that could come up. Because in order to, to have an agile introduction, an agile methodology, an agile culture change working, you need to do something different. because. As we saw in the, part, in the control cycle, this will break, actually, over time. Because it's a negative feedback loop, as systems thinkers would say. So 
So it all goes down, goes back to uh, Robert Austin, measuring and managing performance in organizations. If you do management by measurement, then you have this extrinsic motivations KPIs in full supervision. But on the other hand, what we should go for is delegation. The delegation board from this morning, delegation poker. Well, there could be partial supervision because some duties can't be delegated. Delegation, management by delegation, heavily relies on intrinsic motivators. In the end, there are no other motivators. I can tell you, think faster, but that won't work. Right? It's pride of workmanship. Like, the, if you, who, who knows the software craftsmanship movement? Oh, a few, interesting. They have come up with their own manifesto and said, okay, we're going to raise the bar. They put the agile values on the new right side and came up with a new left side. And it all boiled down to, we care, we practice, we learn, and we share in the end. We care about our code, we care about the work that we are doing, that is pride in workmanship. But we also have to do deliberate practice, we also have to constantly learn new things as we go from there. And we have to share it with each other, like on a conference or in local user groups. But we also have to, that's what also part of the software craftsmanship movement is, we don't want to have contract negotiations, not at all. We want to have engaged customers, but we want to have customers that constantly come back to us. So if we please the customer, he has a desire to come back to us and want more. So if you compare it to the control cycle, what else should we do then? We enter the power cycle. So still, we have problems, right? If you solve your number one problem, you promote number two. <clears throat> but we start from power here. And we go with that problem and look around what's going on, what's happening here, how does this problem manifest, or how does it become real, how does it become our problem? If you take a look, for example, at uh, the, the traditional agile retrospectives, that's all in there. Second stage, first of all, set the stage. Second thing was to get the data. That is looking around and see what is there. What problems do we have? How do they manifest themselves? After that, you try to reach clarity. For retrospectives, you do that by generating insights, right? You want to have clarity before you come up with a solution. Or even worse, you don't want to be a solution problem. Right? I have the solution in mind, I want to do this, I want to use this new framework, don't do that. I think Goy could say something along that line on impact mapping there. And with that clarity, you reach a state, okay, this is how we're going to solve our problem, and in the end you Again, this is again this is a self-reinforcing system. We reach trust by putting these experiments in place that we come up doing the retrospectives. And if people see this is working, this is going to be a better solution. So we had theory X before. There's also a, a Y, a theory Y. In theory, theory why you have employees who are ambitious, self-motivated, and they exercise self-control. You can put the whole team in, in one room and, uh, well, colleagues, while watching on my monitor, will say, okay, you're again on Twitter, maybe this is a bit too much today, we need to do work, or you make everything transparent so they can better look around on the task board, or um, you do a lot of programming, for example. I've been involved with, I've heard from, no, I've not been involved, I've just heard from it. I've heard from a workers' council at a company who forbid pair programming because he had too many insights into the work of others so he could evaluate them. Right? I think this is not a good thing. 
So how does management work in theory Y? What can we do better there? That is, we com communicate openly with our subordinates, so we make everything transparent, as Kent Beck pointed out to me two years ago. Uh, if, if you're completely open, if you're completely transparent, you don't put a lot of energy into hiding all these problems that you could have. Just imagine how much more energy you could put into your pride of workmanship in order to then build better programs or test better programs. Eventually, you minimize differences between the colleagues and even the difference on the hierarchy level. You're more of a coach as a manager in theory why than someone telling others what to do. And that, that was a hard lesson for me once I got promoted to be a software testing group leader. At some point I found out, okay, there was this colleague from me who was seeing me as the boss. And he was, when we had a debate, I thought we were debating on uh, how are we going to put this into place and so on. But instead, he came up with an argument that, oh, he's the boss, he has to have this final word on it, and so on. And that's why we are just debating here around. And I saw, okay, no, this is not my point. We want to find a good solution to start with. That's a hard lecture, because people outside of your management system will not see you in immediately as the same thing. In the end, you need to create a comfortable environment where people can contribute, where people can, can, can be proud of the work they're doing. Okay. So, next thing is, well, one, one thing for consultants is easy to analyze problems. How do we continue from here? Usually what you do is you create two axes, then you have four quadrants, you just have to name things and every problem is solved. Well, two weeks ago I was at Eurostar and on my trip there I was um, thinking, oh, hmm, um, this, this Stacy landscape diagram we use in uh, Scrum introductory courses for the Kinevan model. Um, it's interesting, how does this relate to testing? And I, I had the impression I need, we, we need to, well, since I'm at, at a conference with 600 other good thinkers, even great thinkers, let me bounce this idea back and forth, how could this look like? And uh, I had the opportunity to, to talk to folks like Michael Bolton, Bart Nuck was involved there, I think James Lindsay as well, and I don't know who else. So if you're in the room, it, you were also engaged in that, sorry. Um, the idea is you, you have two axes, right? On one hand, you have formality level. How formal is your testing going to be? How formal does it have to be? And there are more formal contexts on the left side and less formal context on the right side. The other axis is the individual accountability of the tester. How accountable shall we be for our work, for their work? Is it less or more? So the quadrants and, well, I don't think it's just quadrants, it's more a continuum there, it's a landscape, right? That end up there is on the bottom with few individual accountability but high formality where you have to create a lot of documents, you end up with something like traditional test cases, you have to prepare a test case document. On the top side, where you have a high degree of individual accountability but few formality, you end up in highly regulated environments. Two weeks ago, Andy Glover, the cartoon tester, was talking about uh, medical software, and they, he said, have to unit test their test automation code, and it has to be audited. Who, who's, who's unit testing his test automation code here? Just, just very few. Right? I try to do that as often as I have to. Because in the end, software test automation is software development. So why shouldn't we apply the same practices and techniques that we apply to good production code? So on the other side, we have less formality and less individual accountability. 
Uh, I put up crowdsource testing there. I'm not so sure if it fits or not. It is, well, in the end, if there are crowdsource platforms out there where you just submit your, um, submit your product like a mobile app or something like that, then someone else on the internet signs up for that, gets a paycheck in the end on whatever he reported, and then you continue from there. But um, I don't know the accountability level of those testers there. And we have very few formality in what we call agile testing, but a high individual accountability, because if you are the only tester on the team of five, then you have a demand from your team to serve that team, to, bring, to help bring them forward. Uh, you can't sit in your corner and uh, cross thumbs while the others are doing hard work. So this is, I think, the testing landscape that we ended up with. Um, I, was, I was curious, I'm still curious, where the, the traditional software testing schools fit into there. Is, who, who's to know about the software testing, the four schools in software testing? A few, I think mostly context driven, okay. Um, th there are four schools, the basic thing says, which is, uh, we come from an analytical school of software testing where you could analyze the whole program and continue from that. Brian Merrick once wrote that he gave that up in, in the 80s. There's the standard school, there's the factory school and the context-driven school who have all different mindsets regarding what software testing should be about and how it's good applied in, pra in practice. Right? Um, so factory testing could be more along this line, but while thinking over this, we found out, no, it's not about the schools, it's more about what we do in different environments here. All right, so what do we do from there? In the end, we have less formality in agile testing, and, um, but we are still on a team, so we have high individual accountability, but how do we contribute to that team? I'm, I've been made aware of the five dysfunctions of a team from Patrick Lencioni um, during XP 2012, which, is, which J.B. Rainsberger uh, mentioned there a lot of times. So I started reading it and I found, oh, this is interesting. I started reading it on, I think it was Saturday, and I'm halfway through in one day. That was quite interesting. Um, you have five different dysfunctions you could find in a team. That starts, you have to have a large basis of trust. If you don't have trust, you probably don't have a team and you have a, lot, a whole lot larger issue to solve there first. So absence of trust doesn't help you in your team building. After that, there's fear of conflict. If, if you have conflict in your team and no one is, is talking about it, you can't solve that conflict. But you need to have trust as a basement for that. If you don't trust each other, you're certainly not going to talk about it. But trust alone doesn't help. Right. Then you have lack of commitment. That means we're we just talking about, but we're doing something. Not commitment in the scrum sense. Avoidance of accountability. That means, OK, um, we're going to do that, but uh, I'm not going to report on my progress on the task that I took, for example. Or well, what, what I really hate when I come to stand-up meetings, for example, is um, there, there's a whole team standing there and all these programmers are saying, okay, I did this and that yesterday with this thing and then I had this problem and so on. Then the tester gets the ball and says, okay, I, I started testing this thing. That's it. I, I think this is not good communication happening there because probably the programmers don't know what does it mean, what did you do there. But in the end, you have to find out how much level of information they need to have there. And final point, inattention to results, which goes to the direction of uh, whatever product we ship. It's in the end, someone has to buy it, and if we can't achieve that, we are doing something wrong. So. With an absence of trust, you usually have a state of mind which says, 
I'm invulnerable. I'm doing everything right. Has anyone done this? Does everyone think this? Right. No. We certainly end up there. This is uh, a psychological um, bias. No, it's not a bias. It's, it's a tension to go there. I'm doing all the right thing all the time. It would be a happy place to be there, but it's a trap in the end. And it destroys trust at that point. Fear of conflict leads to artificial harmony or shallow agreements that you make, but that don't mean anything in your team. And certainly you can't create teamwork or self-organization from there. Lack of commitment leads to ambiguity in decision-making. For example, if you, it's, it's not against the, the consensus talks who are going to follow next year, but if you just work on consensus, you're probably running into that. If you try to please everyone by consensus, by making just decisions based on consensus, you're probably ending up in ambiguity because you won't agree on anything. You won't please anyone. You will displease, in fact, everyone. That's where lack of commitment leads to. Avoidance of accountability usually leads to low standards. And the final thing is, if you're not paying attention to the results you're delivering, then you have probably just people in your team working for their status and their personal ego. That's not how good teamwork is created, right? It's, it's just, it's a group of people fighting with each other, but that doesn't really have to something to do. And it puts a lot of energy to, to not the right results. So how do we get to the right results? Oh, there's a unicorn. Hmm. Now, the thing is, each of us likes to work in his own comfort zone. But the problem is that there's a whole larger landscape there where not our comfort zone is. That is where the magic happens. So in order to change, we need to leave our comfort zone and we have to, to overcome certain rules which we seem to abandon. We have to tear down the world as we see it all around us. Right? We have to free our mind from the matrix. So how do we get there? I think um, we end up usually in discussions like, okay, it's testers versus programmers. These are more rule, roles in the traditional sense. We are testers, we are programmers, like Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory told us yesterday. Elizabeth Hendrickson did two surveys, one last year, one the year before that, and I hope she's going to do one this year, regarding job advertisements for testers in their local area. And she was looking for words like, has to have programming knowledge and so on. And she found out that the majority of job advertisements for testers had something in relationship with programming there. You should at least be able to read code in the end. And I think where we should go to in order to, to keep the attention to the right results is we, we should not fight with each other like T-shaped person fight with each other, am I going to be a tester or a programmer? Actually, I work for in different roles at different companies. So I could be a scrum master, I could be a scrum product owner, I could be a tester, a developer, a technical coach, a test coach or whatever. I think I'm not a T-shaped person, but a circular person. If you just spin around the T, you get a circle. So, and I think we should move a bit forward and talk more about the testing programmer and the programming tester instead. Because eventually this will lead to unicorn land. <laughs> right. Well, historically, if you take uh, where, where we come from, we have, well, testers have been introduced at some point in time because no one knew more about the domain that was um, getting a new product than these, these actual users coming from operations. Let, let me ask the question, who has pursued software testing as, as, as a career from the beginning, from the university time in this, in this room? Oh, that's more, 
It's more than a room. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I was, um, I found for the first time in Julie, the first person who said this to me, and I said, whoa, you're not so, un you're very special in this regard because most of the time what you hear, this is how I fell in testing, right? So people come from different fields there. And um, historically, this has been the case, but I think in order for our profession to move forward, we have to overcome that. So we should probably talk more about the programming tester and the testing programmer. I heard a story from, from a client, which is interesting, uh, where they were introducing Scrum and CDD and so on. And that programmer said, okay, went to his drawer, opened the drawer, took out his contract and said, there's nothing standing there regarding unit testing in this contract. So I won't do it. Right? So every one of you is thinking, okay, well, that's crazy. He has to do it, of course. Last week, I heard from a subcontractor another story. Oh, just in case, it's a double unicorn, right? In case you didn't mention, uh, notice. Um, last week, I heard the story from um, a tester who was doing the same thing. He was going to his drawer and said, okay, nothing in this context says I need to do programming. What do you think about that? And where's the difference? Why do we make a difference between these two different roles so harshly? All right, I think it won't solve all our problems. We still have testers who, who try to do programming, but maybe are not so good at it, and so on. So we have to find ways in order to, to continue from where we are currently. So that would be like, well, high-fiving a cat, right? Or a shark high-fiving a unicorn in front of an explosion. This is where we should head to. So another consulting tool. Where, where, where are we? Um, th this is drawn from human system dynamics, which is a field uh, which has to do with uh, introducing change into organizations. And um, again, sort of a landscape. We have two axes. We have differences and interactions. The whole thing behind that is the CDE model. CDE stands for containers, differences, and exchanges. And you can see different behavior in this difference matrix. Right? If you have more differences in a couple or in a team, or less differences, and you can have few and even more interactions. Right? So where you end up with is, let me start from uncoupling here. So if I talk to my wife, and we have a lot of differences regarding who's taking out the trash can or so on, but we have few interactions, probably I'm running into a divorce next week. Right? That's uncoupling. Um, on the other hand, if we have few interactions but also few differences, we're in a state which is called belonging, which means uh, we love or hate each other. But that's it. Since we don't talk about our few interactions, it could be good. Then we have self-organization which is we have lots and lots of differences, but we need to have lots and lots of interactions in order to deal with these differences. That's hard to do. Well, not, well it's hard, it costs a lot of energy, but still it leads to self-organization, which is where our teams should be heading to. And in the end, we also have reinforcing behavior, which is we have few differences, and a lot of interactions. Has anyone an example for that? Mm -hmm. I don't see, I see, yeah. Yeah, we have, well, that's an interesting point. So. We have, if we have really T-shaped team members, right, we have not so many differences maybe, but we have a lot of interactions and it works to reinforce the system. There's, there's another thing, 
religion. Another hand in the back. What? <laughs> Mutual app. All right. <laughs> I, I think we should talk in the break. <laughs> right. So, what happens? Well, it's not interesting that you have this model, but it's more interesting that uh, how you come from here, the uncoupling thing, where you are ending up in a divorce, to, well, in a relationship, maybe go to reinforcing, and you have to go through either here or here in order to get there. Right? So in order to get to a re reinforcing state, well, maybe you don't want to, then you can end up in self-organization as well. You need to have either introduce more interactions or deal with some of your differences in order to get there. Okay. So in, if we talk about more about the programming tester and the testing programmer, I think we are settling down some of these differences in the end. Right, so this is our true north. So I have a dream. I have a dream today. That is... <laughs> what? Oh. Oh, a kitten. <laughs> I have a dream today that is that we'll be spending more and more time trying to put the right attention to the right results. That is, ship a product. That's all that counts in the end. Other things won't get you any money. And we have to contribute to that team in order to do that. We have to contribute as a programmer, being a tester, and maybe unit testing, or doing some functional testing of our code on our own, or doing peer review of the work that others did. And we have to also contribute as a tester to that team by maybe being able to pair program with someone else. You don't need to drive maybe in the beginning, but you can still say, OK, this, I think this logic is broken. Can you explain that to me? And I think that would be a first step that could work. All right, that's the end. So, questions? So, questions? Just for my curiosity, on your slide with the tester, programming tester, testing programmer, any special reason for the developer to be stroked out? Or what is your context to stroke it out? You feel a tester is partly a developer as well in a certain context? Well, as I see it, we are contributing to that team in order to develop the product, right? So we are helping developing the product, so why aren't we a developer? I think this distinguishment doesn't really make sense. Tester versus developer doesn't make sense because tester are already developers. It's more the thing, those are doing more programming than me does, which makes the real difference there. And the other one would be ambiguous and would be more like a shallow agreement. Right? But it's a good enough question. Thanks. So, Daniel? To go with your um, pop culture reference, I think the Matrix film is a good analogy. Right. Um, in the film, Neo has to make the choice between the red pill and the blue pill. Yes. And uh, I have here from Wikipedia, the, the red pill represents embracing the sometimes painful truth of reality, and the blue pill represents the choice of choosing blissful ignorance of illusion and staying in that dream you talked about, or the, the, the previous dream. Right. Is, he chooses the red pill in the film so he can die a real death and see what's behind it all. Which one do you recommend we take? <laughs> all right, let me try to answer that from the film. Well, as, as I said in the beginning, that was expectation management. I don't know if you're ready to see what I want to show you. Um, and, well, when I think back to the movie, it is that at some point Morpheus says to Neo that there's a certain age when you don't free them from the Matrix, 
right? And there are others who are not ready for it, so they become an agent. Because so they are so heavily relying on that system that um, they will fight that system, they will help others fight that system in order to fight everyone who's, who's going to, to crash it down. Right? And I think not everyone has to be freed like that. But if you, take, if you continue to, to Matrix 2 and 3, there have been more and more freed from the Matrix at that point in time. So I think we are currently in this state with agile adoptions. We have lots, still lots of um, companies and projects being run by, by Waterfall or something traditional. But we also have more and more enterprises and uh, larger companies doing Agile and starting to free themselves. Does that make sense? All right. I, I think that was also good enough. But I'm out of books now. <laughs> All right. Now, now the bad questions, please. 